Hello, welcome back. Um, and today we are going to be going to our next topic, which is mitosis and meiosis. So that is, we have been setting the stage to talk about like pure classical genetics all these weeks. So this is the last of those lectures before we get into Mendelian genetics or classical genetics next, next week and talk about um, a lot of genetics associated with inheritance of single genes. So let's get started. Uh, for this particular lecture, um, the chapters that are going to be covered from those open textbooks have been listed in here. So it is the chapter, second chapter in open genetics and in Nicol and Barrett, it's gonna be a couple of sections from the chapter two in there as well. So what we will be talking about today is going to be mitosis um, and its various stages, which a lot of it may have been a review for those of you who've already taken molecular and cellular biology. I've also talked about it in my lecture series associated with it, and I will <clears throat> do those links. I would link those um, particular lectures below as well for those of you who want to know about them in a more detailed manner. Uh, and then we are going to be talking about meiosis, uh, sexual reproduction, and how meiosis helps us achieve genetic variation in an organism or in a species. And then finally, we are going to talk about how um, problems with meiosis and problems during these processes can lead to chromosomal um, deletions or inversions, so different structural rearrangements that can happen, different issues that can arise because of that. So the first part that we're going to be focusing on is obviously mitosis. Mitosis is the process through which one cell in our body um, or in an organism divides to two identical daughter cells. This process is the primary way by which our um, different Organisms will replenish their cell supply or grow and develop in a general manner. It is typically not used for reproduction purposes of for an organism, only for normal cell division and normal maintenance and growth of a particular type of cell that our body needs. Uh, so this is this happens with the help of the spindle structure that forms that is made with the help of centrosomes that are present in our cytosols. So these centrosomes at the beginning of mitosis and early mitosis duplicate. And as they move to the two poles, they help create that mitotic spindle uh, that is so important in proper cell division to occur. Mito mitosis happens in four main phases. The first of which is prophase. In prophase, um, you basically are just beginning to have the mitosis form. So in that phase, um, the nuclear membrane is gonna disintegrate. The chromosomes are gonna be visible as the chromatin starts to condense and develops those chromosomes um, in their entire form. And the two poles are going to become visible on both sides as the centrosomes the duplicated centrosomes move to each of the respective sides of the cell. Next, these uh, chromosomes are going to start to line up as well as attach to the spindle fibers that are forming, that are radiating out of these centrosomes. You can learn all about how these centrosomes create or develop the mitotic spindle in my earlier lecture series and I will, as I said, link that video below as well. So this early phase where the chromosomes are beginning to attach to the mitotic spindle and start to line up is called pro-metaphase. It's like a pre-metaphase, early metaphase stage. And then once all those chromosomes have lined up right at the center of the cell, or the equator, the spindle equator, at, um, that is your metaphase stage that you are probably most familiar with in picture or in cell culture or you know, lo visibly looking for it in slices of 
for example, onion root or other types of cells, um, is this exact image. That's the textbook image of metaphase where the chromosomes are lined up at the equator. Now, in um, mitosis, because you are not uh, creating gametes, you are going to keep your over all DNA content, right? You're going to keep all the chromosomes. The chromosome number will remain the same throughout. So in the beginning of mitosis, your chromosomes are uh, formed with the two sister chromatids attached at that kinetochore. So they are together in there. Uh, so your chromosome number is constant here. So for example, in humans, that number is going to be 46 chromosomes, and there'll be 46 chromosomes here, 23 pairs. And they're all going to line up along that equator in a center um, in the middle of that cell with the two sister chromatids joined together. Now, next phase, the there is a process that happens where proteolysis of these proteins that are helping attach this system together at that gametochore um, to the mitotic spindle fibers is going to trigger sister chromatid separation. So the two sister chromatids separate as they get pulled, or rather as the mitotic spindles um, start to move towards the respective pole. And this process is uh, called anaphase. So this is where you go to the anaphase stage. And that's what you can see here. The two sister chromatids will separate away from each other in this process. And the cell is going to get stretched out as well with the elongation of these mitotic spindle uh, microtubules. And then finally, in telophase, you will begin to see the nuclear membrane reform around each of the two um, pair, you know, each of the two sets of chromosomes. And you will also uh, have the cytokinesis starting to happen where the two cells are going to now eventually separate into two identical daughter cells. Now, one of the things that is important in here is that there are checkpoints all throughout the way to check and make sure each process is happening appropriately. And if a particular process doesn't happen properly, for example, if the chromosomes don't line up properly at the equator during metaphase, the process will stall until the block is removed, until the issue is solved in some way, shape, or form. Similarly, if there was a chromosome that was not attached to the mitotic spindle, that will also prevent these sister chromatids from separating and forming in, uh, you know, moving to the opposite poles during anaphase. Uh, so there are checkpoints in place, not only in interphase, obviously, to go from one phase to the next, but also during mitosis as the cells are dividing into two daughter cells. So now we're going to switch over and talk about meiosis, uh, which is obviously the way in which gametes are formed. So this is important for sexual reproduction, uh, for the cells to be able to go through the process of meiosis and to form gametes that have half the genetic information, half the number of chromosomes. Um, so cells that are able to go through meiosis are called meiocytes. And they are going to start off as diploid, 2N in humans, obviously, cells. Um, in this process, there are two successive rounds of cell division so that your final outcome will contain four daughter cells. And those four daughter cells will not be identical in this case and will contain a mix of uh, paternal and maternal uh, genes, depending on how they panned out during the process. This is also called a reductional division because you are going to take the total number of chromosomes and you're going to have it in the first part of cell division in meiosis 1 um, so that in humans we start off with your 46 chromosomes. At the end of meiosis 1 you will only have 23 chromosomes. One of each pair will be in the daughter cells while the other one will be in the other. And then in the second part of meiosis, 
second division of meiosis will pretty much look very similar and almost identical to mitosis in the sense that the two sister chromatids in these 23 chromosomes will now separate. So now the chromosome number will be maintained in the second part in mitosis, uh, in meiosis two. And at the end, you're gonna end up with four daughter cells, each containing one and DNA content um, and 23 chromosomes. So meiosis one is where this reduction happens. So that's the one that is called the reductional division. This is where you're also gonna have the synapses happen where the two homologous chromosomes in this case are going to interact with each other allowing for crossing over and recombination to occur which gives us the different variations in the genome that are possible um, and then in meiosis 2 it is called an equational division because it pretty much like i said resembles mitosis and the chromosomes are no longer going to have any of these other extra things to do that they did in meiosis one. And in this one, it will be a simple separation of the sister chromatids in those remaining 23 chromosomes, and um, you will get two identical, so to speak, um, chromosomes. Although, again, they will not be identical because of the presence of these areas that have crossed over to allow for recombination. So this kind of goes through that process. In prophase one, you are going to have the homologous chromosomes line up instead of the homologous, instead of individual chromosomes. So they are gonna, in prophase one, as the homologous chromosomes come together, they are going to form synapses with each other at different points that those points are where you will possibly see recombination happen due to crossing over. These points also allow them to then come together and as the spindle fibers are formed by the so those centrosomes um, and centrioles, they are going to bind to these chromosomes in a way that the homologous chromosomes stay together and line up at the equator together. Um, so here you can see that you are going to have um, the two homologous chromosomes in the pair joined together at the equator in metaphase one. As they separate and the crossing over is completed, you will see the remnants of, you know, the effect of that in the form of um, recombination where portions of the genome have been swapped between the two interacting chromosomes, chromosome arms in this case. So each one of your chromatids are now going to be a little bit different than what they started with before. Um, and so the, but in anaphase one, again, the two chromosomes in this case, the homologous chromosome pair, uh, the homologous chromosomes will separate go to their respective poles. So by the end of telophase one and cytokinesis, you are going to have two daughter cells, each with an ent one entire DNA set, not a, a pair of chromosome, but just one copy of each chromosome. From here, it's gonna directly go back into, it's never gonna form the nuclear membrane again, but rather go directly into the second um, division in prophase two again you're going to have the spindle fiber forming uh, and this time the chromosomes are going to line up like they normally do at the equator um, so that it is now going to be joining those two sister chromatids um, and then in anaphase two these sister chromatids will separate leading to the formation of four different looking daughter cells, each with one and DNA content and 23 chromosomes. So let's look at this uh, exact process where you get the recombination in um, meiosis. So this is in crossing over. So here I have a cartoon image or, uh, you know, an image of how this process occurs in a diagram form along with uh, some actual images from uh, 
a microscope to show how the DNA is interacting in these different forms at various parts of cell cycle. So in down here, um, the images that you are looking at, your DNA is visible in these, the DNA is stained, and you can see it in panel A in just the interface kind of, it's beginning to condense, but it's not there yet. It's still, it's chromatin form inside the nucleus. And B, you can see it forming the chromosomes beginning to condense and start to form the chromosomes. In C, the chromosomes are fully visible right here, and you can see them, right? The chromosomes are very clearly visible over here, and those chromosomes are going to be attached to each other. So you can see homologous chromosome pairs. You see crossing over happening at specific points within these. Right, so at several of these chromosomes, you can see actual points of crossover. Um, in D, you can see these uh, homologous chromosome pairs lined up that are then separating to form the two daughter cells in that first cell division. And so these two daughter cells are going to have half the number of chromosomes because they're just going to have one pair or one set. So you're starting off with four homologous pairs, right? Four pairs of uh, chromosomes. And here you have now four chromosomes each and each side, actually five. And then here, one, two, three, four, five on either side. Now here it's going to directly go back into the second cell division immediately where the chromosomes are going to line up in, now at the equator in metaphase two and start to separate the two um, sister chromatids are going to separate out, leading to formation of four daughter cells. So let's look at this um, complex as the recombination happens. You have your homologous chromosomes that are joined at the, mm -hmm. the two sister chromatids in each case are joined at the kinetochore, um, and the centromeres are going to bind there as well. And then there are going to be some proteins that are going to cause these two homologous chromosomes to be together. These proteins that are keeping them together are part of the synaptonemial complex. So the synaptonemial complex are basically proteins that bind to both homologous chromosomes along their entire length and hold them together in this structure that we also call bivalent. So when they are joined together like this kind of, you know, with the synaptonemal proteins kind of sandwiched between them, um, it is called a bivalent. So these are bivalent pairs right here. Uh, they form completely and random. So it's not like all the paternal chromosomes line up on one side and maternal on the other. They can be either way, uh, which further makes it um, likely to get even more different combinations than just a symbol two to the n. Um, n is where your n is the number of chromosome pairs that you've got. Uh, so it's not just a symbol, all of them will line up one way or another. They can line up in any different direction as they meet. Um, during crossing over, the DNA repair enzymes actually break the bonds in the chromosomes itself, in the two non-sister chromatids where the crossover will occur, and covalently reattach the non-sister chromatids to the opposite side. So if there was, you know, if you look at them over here, you have those homologous chromosomes aligned at um, together. In this case, all um, together and the point where the sister chromatids are crossing over in this particular complex, that complex is going to get broken up by uh, the DNA repair enzymes that are going to break these bonds in this both sides where the crossover occurs and then reattach them to the opposite side, leading to your two non-recombinant, you know, so these two cross sister chromatids that combined, crossed over, and swapped material are called the recombinant chromatids. And the two remaining chromatids that did not cross over, the outer ones in this case, 
are going to be termed non-recombinant chromosomes. They remain identical to the original parent uh, chromosome that they came from. So this results in obviously a lot of different possibilities. So all four daughter uh, cells that will arise from this chromosome are going to be completely different, right? They'll have some variability between them. Uh, and so this is how we end up having recombination happening in alleles and uh, um, enhancing the variability present in the species. The chiasmata that you see, this cross over these uh, at this point when the chromatids are crossing over, this is called chiasmata and are also called tetrads because they're four chromatids together at that point. Um, this holds the homologous chromosomes during meiosis one all the way until they successfully segregate and separate into their separate cells. So let's look at it a little bit more at how exactly the microtubules help in the separation process itself. Um, so the process of chromosome alignment is different when you're in meiosis 1 versus meiosis 2, simply because in meiosis 1, you have the two homologous chromosomes that are getting joined together first and have to be kept in their, you know, aligned state and then be attached to the kinetic core microtubules. And in meiosis 2, it is the individual chromosome itself and it's just the sister chromatids that are going to be joined to the centromere um, all together at the centromere by those kinetical microtubules. So it is different for those two. In prometaphase 1, so this is during meiosis 1, the microtubules attach to the fused kinetochores, right? So these are where the two sister chromatids are joined together um, of homologous chromosomes, and the homologous chromosomes are going to be arranged at the midpoint of the cell of metaphase 1, not the individual chromosomes. And in anaphase 1, these two homologous pairs are what's going to be separated, but the sister chromatids will remain attached at that central point at the central mirror. In prophase, uh, in prometaphase 2, however, the sister chromatids, which are held together by that central mirror, are the ones that point is where the microtubules attach to the individual kinetochores of the sister chromatids rather than the fused kinetochores, right? So the fused kinetochores in prometaphase 1 keep those two sister chromatids together. But here, those individual um, kinetochores, those two kinetochores, one on each of the sister chromatids is what's getting attached with the microtubule so they can be separated away from each other during anaphase 2. So in this one, it's just kind of giving you a comparison between mitosis and meiosis, where both of them start off with 2N-DNA content. So um, in this, in the first stage, your chromosomes have, you know, in both cases, the chromosomes have duplicated, but the duplicated chromosomes remain away from each other, and just the two sister chromatids are joined together at that kinetochore or uh, at the centromere. And in the case of meiosis 1, the chromosomes have duplicated. After duplication in meiosis 1, they are going to form tetrad where the two pairs of sister chromatids are joined together with the help of these synaptonemal proteins complex as well as the crossing over that is happening between them. And then during metaphase, the duplicated chromosomes will all align at the metaphase plate in mitosis, while in metaphase 1, it's the tetrads that align at the metaphase plate, not simple single chromosomes. During the end result of mitosis, you're going to have two diploid daughter cells that essentially are identical to each other, while in meiosis, at the end of meiosis 1, you will have two haploid, so you will be, have a reduction in the chromosome number as the two um, as homologous chromosome pairs separate to get one chromosome in each of the daughter cells. And then at the end of meiosis 2, you're going to have four haploid daughter cells as a result. So this meios, process of meiosis is obviously extremely important in sexual reproduction. 
and it is one of these early evolutionary innovations that happened after eukaryotic cells appeared because it allowed for variation among offspring that is very needed for survival of species long term and to increase the population um, within that species. So it allows for species to obviously evolve with the environment and with their needs to change and adapt to variant, variable environments and be able to grow and continue to uh, survive over time. So during the life cycle of sexually reproducing organisms, you actually have the different types. You don't have all different types of sexually reproducing organisms uh, reproducing the same way. So um, the fertilization and meiosis obviously are important in all sexual life cycles, but the way it happens will be dependent on what type of organism you're looking at. So there are three main categories of life cycles in multicellular organism. The first one is what we usually think about when we think about sexually producing organisms, and that's diploid dominant, where only haploid cells are produced by the organisms as the gametes. Otherwise, every other cell is going to be diploid, but only haploid cells that are going to be produced are those gametes that are produced by gonads, by sex cells, right? Um, those are specialized diploid cells in gonads, and those are the ones that are going to produce gametes that are then going to be uh, joined together to be fertilized to make the um, next progeny. In haploid dominant, and this is, uh, you know, so most animals, are going to have diploid dominant life cycles. On the other hand, you have other organisms that do not follow diploid dominant. So most fungi and algae are in a different category, which is haploid dominant. And their body in general is going to be haploid and it's just formed by mitosis. So they can grow and develop and reproduce uh, in that way. Uh, just the simple body cells, like our cells are all diploids, in that case will be haploids. And only during sexual reproduction, the haploid cells from two separate individuals, kind of like, you know, X, um, the male and female in the animals, they have plus and minus mating types in these fungi and algae that will combine together to make diploid zygotes. And those diploid zygotes can create spores or will create four spores through meiosis immediately after formation. These spores can remain dormant and can be a survival mechanism for these species so that um, they can get through hard times or and allow them to be more resistant to environmental changes. And then when the conditions are correct, they can go back into their haploid dominant state and regrow those bodies um, with the help of mitosis like they did before. Another one that is used by some, uh, by a lot of the plants and some algae is alternation of generation, which is kind of a blend of the other two. Here, this organism alternates between a haploid dominant versus a diploid dominant state. Um, the haploid plants in this case are called gametophytes um, and they are obviously going to create gametes as well, while the diploid zygote will lead to the sporophyte, which will create spores. So we will learn more about them later this semester when we talk more about this process as well. So the next thing that uh, we will talk about is chromosomal abnormalities that can happen when meiosis goes wrong, either during, most likely during meiosis one, but you should, any uh, during the recombination process or uh, during non-disjunction. So the chromosomal abnormalities that are most likely to happen during meiosis are deletions of part of the chromosomes um, during crossing over, duplications of different parts, and that would be most likely earlier in the process, not at this time. Um, inversions, insertions that can all be due to incorrect um, coming together recombination happening after a crossing over, and then finally translocation, which is when the chromosome, um, the chromatid is completely translocated to a different chromosome. So chromosome nine combining with chromosome seven 
and uh, making very different uh, structures in that case. So in a chromosome inversion, you can have two different types of inversion. So here is an example where you have a normal chromosome, ABC, and it has you know, six different genes on it. You can have pericentric inversion, which will involve the centromere, right? And so they flip along the centromere so that now uh, C and D are in opposite orientation. Or they could be paracentric or inversion where the centromere is not involved in the inversion itself. And so it's just on one of the arms of the chromosome and some of the genes are flipped because of the way they have inverted. Um, and this involves detachment, obviously, of that chromosome at that point and reinsertion of that part of the chromosome after a 180-degree rotation. Um, and this depends um, on what type of um, inversion has happened. It may only just cause a change in the orientation of the gene, so it's going in the opposite direction, but it could also lead to a more drastic effect if that inversion leads to a more distant regulation or you know, movement of the regulatory system of that gene far away so that it can no longer interact with it appropriately. So in an inversion pairing, the next time that particular cell is trying to, if it was to try and form um, some kind of uh, meiosis, function where it has to pair together, it's going to have a problem, right? So the homologs cannot just simply pair, but rather one of them would have to loop around in some way to make those alignments correct. Because remember, during those homologous uh, pairing, during synapses, for synapses to occur, you have those uh, chromosomes aligned all the way from top to bottom. And it can't happen if you have an inversion in place without one of the chromosomes looping to make points with the make contacts with those structures. This is going to obviously cause the chromosome to kind of bend out of proportion and bend out in a way that it doesn't get deformed in some way. And it can um, lead to imprecise synapses, obviously. Uh, so here's a fun fact that humans and chimps cytogenetically differ by pericentric inversions at several chromosomes. And so that's one of the difference that you see that even when the sequences of individual genes are the same, that it's just a pericentric inversion on different um, chromosomes that is part of what makes us who we are. And specifically, you know, a pericentric chromosome 18 inversion, it was thought to be um, a very early human uh, inversion that caused the divergence from the common ancestor with chimpanzees five million years ago. So another type of problem that can occur during meiosis would be translocation. So in translocation, this is again one of those things that can lead to a major or drastic effects downstream is where two different chromosomes are now joined together after um, this process has occurred. So this is uh, when a segment of one chromosome, once it is separated, does not get joined together to its you know, non-sister chromatid arm, but rather to an entirely different chromosome altogether, a non-homologous chromosome. This can be benign in some cases, but can many times lead to detrimental effects because of gene possessions being too out of sync with their regulatory sequences. And it's associated with several cancer as well as schizophrenia. Um, this is okay in some cases if there is no gain or loss of genetic information and the regulatory sequences are not affected by it. Oh no. So next time, um, this was a short lecture today. Uh, next time, which I will try to post within the next couple of days, is going to be a super fun lecture on classical genetics where we will talk about how single genes, um, inher gene inheritance works in a classical manner 
and what are different ways that alleles show up in the resulting organisms. So it will be a really fun and cool lecture. Uh, look forward to that. See you then.